everyone. Hi, welcome or welcome back to my channel. I'm Shelly and what are we doing today? Well, today's video is very much inspired by some imagery. Uh, the other day, actually the other day, yesterday and this morning, my husband Ted was showing me some really cool um, images and um, a couple of clips from this movie called The Love Witch, which is a movie that came out in 2016 and it is a feminist horror comedy that very much looks like it is from the 1960s. And there are some images that have to do with this dramatic eye makeup and I was very much in inspired by that. And so I did some makeup playtime in which I created this look just in my bathroom and my husband gently encouraged me to make a video. Um, the only video that I have planned for are my top five favorite females in literature, i.e. Uh, my favorite female protagonists. Each lady is very unique and very distinct. And so I'm gonna start with the oldest, the book that, uh, that was published the longest time ago. Our first leading lady shows up at the beginning of the 1800s and is penned by none other but by <laughs> by none other than the great novelist Jane Austen and I am talking about Pride and Prejudice. The character that I am referencing is the Lizzie Bennet who is quiet and centered and grounded especially against her rather snarky and snippy father and her absolutely hysterical and over-the-top mother <laughs> and Compared to them, Lizzie seems like the most grounded and level-headed creature that ever did walk the earth until she is around Mr. Darcy, our leading man. <laughs> and she tends to make rash judgments and um, definitely her prejudices come out. Um, but throughout the novel, I love that we see her grow and change, which is just satisfying, subtle, and perfectly done in Austen's writing. While Lizzie Bennet and Mr. Darcy uh, get their quick-witted banter on, we're gonna be moving up 90 years, about 90 years, to 1905, in which this next leading lady is part of New York's elite. And she doesn't necessarily belong there, though her conflict is an, an external one. It's actually an internal one. And she is often faced with morally questionable decisions. And some of her choices, I don't think I agree with. And I'm talking about the ever complicated, the ever gorgeous <laughs> Lily Bart from Edith Wharton's The House of Mirth. This was originally published in 1905 and Lily Bart is just one of the most complicated characters I have ever met. She is, like I said, part of the upper crust of New York society and yet she's not supposed to be there because her parents were technically impoverished. But she is well-bred and so she knows how to play this game. But sometimes, and in some instances, she does get herself in over her head. And it is because of some of those choices does the novel's suspense just take off and really twist and turn. I think I had originally said that I don't think I've ever uh, read a novel before this one, but it was really just an over the top st statement to say that I just absolutely love The House of Mirth by Edith Wharton. Lily Bart was poor trying to sit among the wealthy, but our next character, she is poor and basically living hand to mouth. And she doesn't shy away from those gritty details. And I'm talking about the centered, observant, inspirational character of Francie Nolan in Betty Smith's A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, which was originally published in 1943. This is such a stunning portrait of Brooklyn, New York. You definitely go through about two decades from 1900 to 1920, and you're mostly following through the eyes of Francie Nolan, who is living absolutely in some of the most barest and saddest and poorest situations that I've ever read about in literature. 
But what's interesting is not the circumstances of which she lives, although that is a huge um, curiosity uh, driver in the book, um, or the, it's one of the things that made me keep reading, but rather one of the more interesting aspects of the book is the complicated relationship that she has with her mother, who is hardworking and yet disillusioned by her marriage, and the complicated relationship that Francie has with her father, who is um, an alcoholic and an idealist and has a lot of struggles. And what's interesting is that Francie, she tends to hide away in books, <laughs> which is somewhat familiar. And um, somehow she does keep her idealism about the world. And I just really appreciate her point of view. So Francie Nolan, amazing protagonist. This next character was actually based on, the author has stated, is based on if Pippi Longstocking grew up. This is who this character is based off of, which is kind of a shock because I wouldn't think that you would get this badass character from Pippi, Pippi Longstocking, and yet you do. She first showed up in Swedish um, in 2005, and then was translated into English in 2008, and that is Stieg Larsson's Lisbeth Salinger in the series uh, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, or the Millennium series. Um, what I love about Lisbeth Salander is that she has her own internal sense of justice. If she thinks that someone has wronged other ladies in some way, she will get back at them. <laughs> Especially if she's thought about 1500 steps ahead and has realized that in the bigger, larger structure of things, this will be better if this guy is put in line. <laughs> And there is something so satisfying. There is something so fun to see Elizabeth Salander roam the world unchained, unhinged, and living by her own rules. <laughs> now, it doesn't always uh, go as planned, um, and I don't know what she'll get up to in the third book, but I can't wait because I'm going to be reading that soon. And if you are looking for just a strong, no nonsense, I live by my own kind of rules type of lady in literature, then the girl with the dragon tattoo, Lisbeth Salander is your girl. We have come to the character that I would love to meet in real life if she was real. Not that I wouldn't want to meet Lisbeth or Lizzie, Be Lizzie Bennett <laughs> or um, Lily Bart, but it is that I think that she would be really fun to hang out with. She's 72 years old uh, from Beirut and she translates for fun. She actually translates books that were previously translated, that's like her thing, for fun in her free time. And so I would love to ask how she got into this process and I would just love to pick her brain and I'll just tell you who she is. And that is Aaliyah from uh, Rabih El Alam I just learned how to say his name, Alamindin. Um, Rabi Elamendi's An Unnecessary Woman. Aaliyah is living by herself in Beirut, which sounds like kind of a, a mundane thing, but for as you get to know her and her circumstances and the culture of Le the Lebanese, then you realize that a woman living alone um, in her own space is quite the task. And through her story, I was able to not only appreciate Aaliyah, but I became wildly invested in her struggle. I was like, I want this, I want all the good things to happen to her. And so when the seemingly minor, uh, I'm not gonna spoil it, but the seemingly mi minor climax, when that happens, I felt like my heart was in my eyeballs and in my throat and up in my chest because I just wanted the best for her. And um, and yeah, so anyhow, if you are interested in spending time with a pretty funny, quiet shut-in 
who loves literature, I'm telling you, loves literature, then uh, Aaliyah, she is your girl. All right, well, that is it. <laughs> These are my favorite women in literature. Um, as always, please let me know who your favorite females in literature are. I would love to know. Um, yeah, and that's it for me. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for being here, and I will see you all in my next one. Bye, guys. Thank you.